Ah, yes. Hello, here we are again. This is now Tarot Lesson number 152. So, I have a Substack account, and there'll be a link in the description down below if you want to sign up for the newsletter. There's, there are three posts there at the moment, and I'll be sending out the first newsletter in a couple of days. So, um, and then we'll take it from there. Today, the first point I want to make is going to save you a huge amount of time. And the second point I want to make is showing you how you can discover meanings and hidden possibilities of tarot cards. And I'll get to that in a bit. So th this all began because um, I can't remember how I came across it, but there was something about the Six of Batons. And people... There's a lot of videos on YouTube and books about tarot correspondences. So what they want you to do is, that's the six of batons. Instead of, look, but they don't encourage you to look at the six of batons, which has got somebody on a horse and teamwork and people around and make sense of the card based on the picture. They want you to translate this into astrological symbolism and it's a terrible waste of time. And I want to explain in a little bit uh, how and why and what what, what the, the, the difficulties can be with trying to use correspondences. And it, it basically revolves around how much understanding and knowledge do you actually have of the planet and the sign involved with the connection with the card. So... Um, this uh, Six of Batons is supposed to represent Jupiter in Leo. And Jupiter is the so-called greater benefic, so it's meant to bring good luck and good fortune. And Leo is the king, and so you're meant to put the L Jupiter and Leo together, and, and so this card shows great success and good fortune coming your way, and personal confidence and the rest of it. However, that's all very well, but I've got these notes here and I have to, because I've got specific things I want to say, I kind of wrote it down. So, and question one is, what is Jupiter actually? So the symbol for Jupiter is this, like that. And Jupiter, um, it's... There's one, right? And there's two. And you put one and two together and you get th Jupiter. So Jupiter, in some way, is a combination of one and two. And one is the sun and two is the moon. And Jupiter is expansion. It's number three. So I'll, th this can become important later when we look at the second part of the video about discovering meanings and playing and exploring, which is the key, the key idea. So, what is Jupiter actually? Um, the other thing is, I may as well just show you this right now. If you've got a horoscope with 12 houses, so Jupiter is a semicircle between the cusp of the 11th house, which is hopes and aspirations, and the first house, which is the self. So what you've got here in this di this symbol for Jupiter is the cross of matter and you've got a connection between your hopes and aspirations and the self. And that's why Jupiter is good luck and good fortune because you're going for what it is, whatever it is that you want. But we'll get to that. However, my question, my first point was what actually is Jupiter? Because Jupiter might be and sometimes is good fortune and benefits, but also Jupiter overdoes. Jupiter is excess as well as a lot. And so too much sun can burn, as you probably know, or you may know. Too much water can kill a plant. So Jupiter isn't automatically a good thing. And so this six of batons, Jupiter and Leo, isn't automatically a good influence. The second point I wrote here is, Oh yeah, 
it can represent luck. Jupiter can be lucky, okay? And that's fair enough. But the problem with is can be that if you're lucky, you're not motivated to make an effort. You just lie back and, and don't try. And that in itself can be a difficulty because if you 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 keep making mistakes and somebody comes along and bails you out and solves a problem for you, you're not motivated to actually work on yourself or make an effort to improve or make an effort to not get into trouble in the first place because you know that somebody's going to come along and rescue you. So Jupiter can be a bad thing. The next point is, oh yeah, we're talking about Jupiter and Leo, but Anybody who's born has Jupiter somewhere in their horoscope and somewhere in the zodiac. And your natal Jupiter, the Jupiter where, where, which is somewhere when you were born, it can be good or bad, fortunate or unfortunate. So this Jupiter in Leo, if, you've, if you're born and you've got an unfortunate Jupiter, how does that tie in with the six of batons? Does the Jupiter here overcome the problem that you've got with na with your Jupiter natally or not? And do people, do, do people even consider that? The other thing is Jupiter is somewhere in the zodiac. I meant to look it up before we began. And I think Jupiter's in Gemini, which is supposedly not a good place for Gemini. So is, when Jupiter rules two signs, Sagittarius and Pisces, Right? So, when Jupiter is in Pisces, does that mean that the Six of Batons is better? When Jupiter is in Sagittarius, does that mean that, that the Six of Batons is better or has a stronger influence? But when Jupiter is in Gemini, which is opposite and therefore supposed to be weaker, um, the sign that, that it rules Sagittarius, does that mean that the Six of Batons right now isn't as good as it could be? Because Jupiter's in I think it's in detriment. So there's all these difficulties with correspondences. So how do you correctly interpret Jupiter? It's not easy or obvious, I think. The other thing is, what is Leo actually? So people talk about Leo and I, I don't know what people think about Leo, what people know, but Leos have got a thing about their family. So they're very protective of their family and family members. So if you insult the brother or sister or child of a Leo, they're going to take it really personally and they're going to turn against you in some way. Whereas if you're a member of the royal family, if you're the Leo's child, you can say whatever you want about the other members of the royal family and the Leo's not going to mind. But think about that. You're doing a reading for somebody and you, the reader, critique the, the questioner's brother or sister. And let's say the, the questioner's a Leo. If you insult that person's family member, they're not going to want to hear it. You can give them good advice based on the card that comes up. But if you unknowingly insult a member of the Leo's family, they're not going to listen. And that's something about Leo that people don't really consider how old are they as well because that's something you can you can consider about the signs of the zodiac Aries is a child Aries people are like four and five years old even when they're when they're 80 they still act like five-year-olds so Leo is like mid-20s to, th to age 30 they're that kind of age and Think about what you're like at that age. And that's what Lee was like throughout their life. They're born like a 25-year-old. And in a lot of ways, they never get beyond it. If you're born at the very end of Leo, it's different. You're more grown up. But it's very difficult for people, for most Leos, to actually be grown up. Um, and again, you're doing a reading for somebody who's a Leo. Are you taking account of that idea and ex explaining things in a way that a Leo is going to understand or can appreciate. Um, the other thing is there are, um, there are mate signs in astrology. And so, if I can open this pen, Leo and Libra 
are mate signs. They go together in a particular way, as does Cancer and Scorpio, but we'll leave that for the moment because we're talking about Leo. Leo and Libra go together. This explains why Leos are so indecisive and also explains why Librans are so bossy because Libra is meant to be fair and balanced. They're not, well, they can be, but they're really bossy. And I'll give an example that happened a few days ago. My daughter-in-law is, she's from Georgia, from Atlanta, and she had to go to Texas to pick up various things. And she drove back from Texas and she was complaining about the way people drive the United States. And especially in Memphis, where people drive like maniacs apparently. She had to drive through in Memphis to get back to Toronto. So we were talking about driving and driving habits and so on, and how in some parts of the US, or maybe in the whole US, you can get a driver's license when you're 15. And so my daughter-in-law was complaining about how 15 and 16-year-olds are so reckless and they don't know what they're doing. And so her solution to bad driving habits was... She's a Libran, right? The general, bossy Leo. She's a Libran. And her solution was make it, make it that you have to be 21 before you can get a driver's license. So she was going to punish, ev well, not punish, she was going to control everybody before the age of 21. And nobody, no matter what, could get a driver's license un until they turned 21. And that's one way of dealing with a situation, it never occurred to her to maybe help 18-year-olds to be more mature or give them a, a more s s a stringent driving test and maybe they've got to um, drive for six months and then be tested again to make sure they haven't got bad habits. Her solution was not um, deal with people and do what we can to make them better and make them more responsible. Her solution was pass a law. Okay, so the six of buttons is Jupiter and Leo. Maybe, and even if it is, so what? What do you do about that? The second point is from um, uh, Rory Stewart. Um, uh, who is one of the head executives at Ogilvy Advertising in England, in London. And so he, I happened to watch him talking about uh, creativity or the, the power or the strength of, of original thinking. And it's, a, it's, an, it's on YouTube. Um, so he, at one point he talked about bees. So he says that um, uh, if, if you look at bees, scientists discovered that um, bees, they've got this, their, their tails or their rear end portion will w waggle around, it will wave around, and that's what, how they communicate to other bees the direction and the distance to find a good supply of pollen and nectar. So they've got a way of communicating, and 80% of the bees obey or follow the instructions of the bee that's giving them, that's telling them where to go. But 20% don't. And so um, the point about this is, I can't remember what I wrote here. It has to do with, you, you find this with bees and you find it with animals and with ar artificial intelligence as well. You've got what they call the explore-exploit trade-off. So with bees looking for pollen, 80% of the bees follow the rules and go off and go to the no, the place where they know there's going to be good pollen. They're dealing with, with, they're exploiting what already exists. But 20% of them go off and explore. And the thing about this extra 20, the other 20%, they can fail. And it is, they, they can go off and they can fly around and, and maybe, they'll, maybe they'll be lucky and discover something. Maybe they won't. Maybe they'll completely fail. But it doesn't matter. And so part of what, what we need to do is, or what a, good, what's, what's a good idea is to spend maybe most of our time, 80% of our time, exploiting what we know and 20% of our time exploring giving ourselves permission to fail and to get nowhere, but you can maybe get lucky 
or you can have a lucky mistake. And you wouldn't have found that if you'd only focused on exploiting what's there. Because if you exploit, you're, you're exploiting what's already known and what's limited. And the, the, another point that Rory made was the past can be different from the future. If you're exploiting, you're dealing with what you already know and what's past. But the future is not automatically going to be the same as the past. So by exploiting the past, you can miss out a lot because you're not incorporating the future. Um, what's this? Oh, it can be that the future is not yet discovered. Whereas if you explore, it's okay to fail. So it's the difference between, as Rory mentioned, the difference between what is. So we look at the six of batons, what is going on here? We've got success, celebration, victory, happiness, um, a successful outcome, teamwork. That's what is. But the other question to do with exploring is what if? So um, if you've got, and the thing I wrote at the bottom here was, um, if you've got 100 minutes and you're going to study the tarot for 100 minutes, 80 minutes, spend 80% of your time working with ideas that you already know or meanings that you find in a book. And then spend 20% 20, 20 of the time or 20 minutes, if we're dealing with 100 minutes, exploring and wondering what if, knowing that it doesn't matter if it doesn't go lead anywhere. Because it, it's more correct and you've always got the chance of stumbling upon a lucky break. So um, I just want to remember what I wrote down here. Uh, so if we look at... The six of batons. So yes, it's celebration and success. If you look at it, and exp what, what, what else can we do here? There's a horse. How many times have you looked at the six of batons and considered the horse? Because the horse, in a lot of ways, does all the work. The horse carries the rider. And if you would ride on a horseback, you can do 20 miles and not break a sweat. The horse will. But you can travel great distances thanks to the horse. So when the Six of Batons comes up in a reading, are you ever giving consideration to the horse or the person or the company or the, the process that, it, that does all the heavy lifting? Because that's what the horse does. And then maybe what we do, if we're exploring and we can fail and we're like the 20% of the, the bees, maybe we look and see if what we've got a horse. What other cards have horses in them? And we've got the sun card. So what's the connection between the Six of Batons and the sun? We've also got the devil. I mean, the death card has got a horse in it. What's the connection between the six of batons and the death card? And so what you do is you take a bit of time and you wonder about the connection between these two cards. So is the six of batons success, but also the need for a new beginning represented by the death card? Or here we've got the sun card the horse is carrying a baby, a child. So it's new and it's inexperienced. In the death card, death is carrying, a, the, the horse is carrying a skeleton. It's, it's ended up, it's, it's finished. And the flesh has fallen from the, and from the bones. We've got a skeleton, but we've got no living tissue here in the death card. So what's the connection between these three cards? And the other one I've got here is the Knight of Swords, because all the knights have got horses in them as well. So we've got um, four, um, uh, four knights, five, six, seven cards, all with a horse in them. And you, you explore the different ideas and different possibilities from these, three, from these cards and see what you come up with. And it doesn't matter if you fail. And you don't get anywhere, apparently, because you will. The other thing is, almost finished here. Um, I, I wrote down, okay, if we're exploring and it doesn't matter if we fail, we just try anything. B, E, E. If you do some numerology using Cairo's system that I like, 2, 5, and 5 is 12. The word B, B double E, is the hanged man. In what way? Does bees or do bees and their behavior and the queen bee and the hive and worker bees and 
gathering pollen and gathering nectar and making honey, how does that relate to the hanged man? It, it does in some way because the hanged man is number 12 and the, let, the, the, the word B, B double E, adds up to 12. There has to be or there is some kind of connection between them. And the last but not least, I came across this quote and I can't remember where it came from and I didn't write down where it came from. I just wrote down the quote and it made me think of the hanged man because somebody somewhere wrote... A man who is suspended looks the same as one who is standing. But the interplay of forces within him is nevertheless quite different. So that he can act quite differently than can a standing man. When was the last time you thought about the energies operating inside or within the hanged man? As opposed to somebody standing upright. So it gives you something to think about and imagine or wonder or come across a quote to do with energy within the hanged man. And what is it that the hanged man can do? How can the hanged man act quite differently than can a standing man? What can the hanged man do, actually, even though he seems to be unable to move and not free? What can the hanged man do that... The standing man can't. So it gives us a, a way of understanding the positive side of the hanged man, maybe. That when the hanged man comes up, instead of thinking, no, you're stuck, you're, you're, there's going to be delay, it's not going to work. You think to yourself, what can you, dif- what can you do differently than most people would normally think is possible? Because the energy within the hanged man can act differently from that of a standing man. Okay, that's it for the moment. Next time I'm going to look at court cards in some detail. I was going to do it today or right now, but it's too much. It's too long. So um, that was it for the moment. Thanks for watching. And by all means, uh, okay, because the next one is going to be about the hanged man, if you've got questions, specific questions about the hanged man, put them in the comment down below and I'll incorporate them into the next video. Or... Go to Substack and sign up for the free subscription um, and then leave a comment there or um, and we'll see what we do with the next one about court cards because people find it a struggle and people are never sure what to do with the court card. That will all change as of the next video. So thanks for watching and have a good day. Okay, bye-bye.